All right, why don't we go ahead and get started? I know folks are still joining, um, but I wanna get in as much of this panel as we possibly can. So good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tammy Gilden. I'm the Associate Director of Policy and Advocacy here at the Jewish Community Relations, excuse me, at the Jewish Council for Public Affairs. Um, it's wonderful to be with you all um, on today's webinar on combating the genocide of the Uyghur people. The Uyghur, a, Tur a Turkic ethnic minority residing in the Xinjiang province of China, have faced decades of religious and cultural oppression and now a genocide. Today, we're going to discuss the ongoing atrocities being committed against them, learn what the Jewish community can do, and hear a moving account from a Uyghur advocate. But before we begin, I want to say a few words about JCPA, which is the National Network Hub of the Jewish Community Relations Network, representing 125 local Jewish Community Relations Councils and 16 national Jewish agencies, including the four denominations of American Judaism. Together, we build consensus and advocate for a just and pluralistic society, promote human rights around the, around the world, uh, and support peace and security in Israel. If you find today's webinar inform informative and want to continue to support our work, we hope that you will join us for future JCPA webinars and consider making a donation to JCPA to support our future programming and our ongoing work. For more information, please visit jewishpublicaffairs.org. And also, I want to invite you all to join our first ever an virtual annual conference, uh, April 25, 25th and 26th. Um, and to learn more, visit JCPA 2021.org for more information. And with that, I'd like to introduce today's moderator, today's moderator, Amber Mays, Holocaust educator and human rights associate for the Indianapolis Jewish Community Relations Council. She is also the co-founder and chief program officer for the Crane Center for Mass Atrocity Prevention, a nonprofit dedicated to addressing the root causes of violence. Thank you so much, Amber. I'll let you take it from here. Thank you, Tammy. Um, first and foremost, I want to thank you all for taking time away from your busy schedule to, uh, to join us for today's important conversation. We've all gathered here today to learn more about what is happening to the Uyghur people along with other Turkic minorities in China. Um, and I know uh, Tammy provided just a little bit of background, but I'm going to provide just a little bit more context and framing. Um, so since the late 1980s, the Chinese Communist Party or the CCP, the government of China has engaged in an oppressive campaign against the Uyghurs. Uh, the, as part of a crackdown in 2016, the CCP constructed a vast network of detention and forced labor camps throughout the region that now intern millions of people and establish sophisticated surveillance systems to ensure the remaining Uyghur population comply with a vast array of restrictions. Now the, the CCP claims that these camps are vocational training centers aimed at re-educating the Uyghur population. However, testimonies from survivors as well as leaked Chinese documents in a vastly different picture. Independent reports have been able to corroborate the claims and provide exacting detail as to what is happening within the region. Um, and just to give some examples of what the Uyghur are facing, uh, children are forcibly removed from their parents. Uyghur intellectuals are arbitrarily detained and disappeared. The Uyghur population has been used for organ harvesting and is currently being used for forced labor. Rape of Uyghur women by ethnic Hun Chinese is sanctioned by the state. Religious practices, cultural customs, and the Turkic language have been systematically destroyed. Uyghur men, women are subjected to forced sterilizations and abortions. And the CCP is carrying out extrajudicial killings. Reports indicate that there are about two to three million detainees of the camps are subjected to forced political indoctrination, physical torture, food deprivation, and overcrowded conditions. Uyghurs who have yet to be interned in the camps are subject to 24-hour surveillance and required to attend political meetings, take part in written and spoken Mandarin language classes, and face harsh religious observance restrictions, such as the forced burning of prayer rugs and consumption of non-halal food. 
they have been forced to surrender their passports and must receive special permission from local officials to leave their home villages, which severely limits their right to freedom of movement. In January, the United States declared that what is happening to the Uyghur people is a genocide. To provide more insight, I would like to welcome our panelists. We are joined today by Uyghur activist and founder and president of the American Turkic International Lawyers Association, Rehan Asat, the founder and managing director of Hong Kong Democracy Council, Samuel Chu, director of global advocacy for the Uyghur Human Rights Project, Louisa Cohen Grave, and edu executive director of Jewish World Watch, Serena Oberstein. At the end of our individual presentations, we will have an opportunity to answer some of your questions. As you listen, please put your questions in the Q&A chat box. So I would like to begin with Rehan. Rehan, you are an international lawyer and a Uyghur rights advocate, as well as the sister of Ekbar, who was detained by the CCP five years ago. Can you please tell us more about your brother and the journey you have been on to get him released. Yeah, no, thank you so much. Um, I really hope like my brother's ordeal would provide a glimpse as to um, the harrowing injustice and just the unspeakable cruelty that my own community is facing. Um, you know, as you rightfully said, it's since 2016, and my brother is like one of the primary targets for the Chinese government's prison camps. One, just being obviously like, you know, ethnically Uyghur. Um, second, he's a person of prominence within the Uyghur society. Um, he's a media founder and philanthropist, and, you know, he has done so much contribution to the Uyghur society, as well as to the Chinese society as a whole. In fact, he provided many opportunities for up and coming writers, journalists, and, and musicians and artists as well, because of his platform. So it's a combination of Facebook, if you will, and the New York Times. So you can befriend people, can chat with them, but at the same time, it has a new section, column section, and, and so forth. And, you know, his um, actually, because of his promise and success landed him this incredibly great opportunity um, to meet with the, the US ambassador, then US ambassador, Obama appointee, Ambassador Max Bacchus. And after that meeting, they nominated him to the State Department's most prestigious program called International Business Leadership Program. So on April 7th, almost exactly five years ago, because we're on April 2nd right now, um, he came on to this program and he met with our lawmakers here in DC and he visited like several other states that from Florida to Indiana. Um, and during his trip, like I just had an absolute pleasure to meet with him. We, we had a lovely dinner and a walk and in the park and so forth. And <sighs> You know, actually, like, I mean, there's a lot of regret. I, I always talk about this. My regrets are everywhere and he's nowhere. Um, because at that time, I was so busy with my school. I was just finishing up law school. And he asked me to prioritize my study. We, we had a brief meeting, but I want to spend more time. Because had I ever thought this would be the last time I'm meeting with my brother, I would have gone to even like San Francisco to meet with him. Um, and he's like, you know, I'm coming back in two months to your graduation. Like, this is not like the end of our story. Um, because like my graduation is about to, was like two months after. And he was supposed to come with my parents and my, you know, his seat remained empty, including my parents. Because once he couldn't come, like there's no reason that my parents would just leave him behind. And over the past few years, I mean, like what I have gone through, like is just absolutely cruel and just unspeakable. And nobody can imagine unless you've, you're, you're in this position. And, you know, as a sister and lawyer, I mean, I have all the tools and resources that are available for me, like, but he's detained in China. I cannot just, you know, like, um, take up his case with an organ of justice. There's no rule of law or anything. We're talking about an authoritarian government, but also like this, um, this fear that I felt because, you know, after my brother, I started to hear like so many 
prominent Uyghur intellectuals and influences are being disappeared into the shadows of these internment camps. And I can sense this fear even just talking to my family and I didn't want them to put them at risk. That's why um, I remained silent for four years. Uh, but meanwhile, I also met with the, the State Department officials. I met with members of Congress, and uh, finally, I had a you know Senate Human Rights Caucus um, combined with s s several senators like issued a joint statement to the Chinese ambassador and asked him like, well, his detention undermined the very goal of this program designed to achieve, which is to foster U.S.-China relationship, and detaining even like model citizen like him. Uh, into these vast camps, like what is the goal of the Chinese government try to achieve? So ultimately, um, I'm still campaigning for my brother. He hasn't been released. And, and, and my story is just one of the millions of stories. And, you know, oftentimes because of the sheer numbers of people who are detained, I think we, we you know, these people just become a number. No, these are somebody's brothers, sisters, brothers, and neighbors. And maybe for some, it's just one of the millions, but for me, he's one in the millions. And um, and I hope like, you know, people can, and especially with the Jewish community, and I, I did mention in this, um, beautiful uh, quote that, uh, you know, I, I hope like, you know, you, um, I felt like, you know, reserving seed for the Uyghur communities through uh, Seder, I felt like there was a new meaning, um, this festival that the souls of the Jewish and Uyghur people are entwined in, in our joint pursuit of seeking peace and establishing justice. And since the Jewish people have, um, you know, experienced something of this horrific and it has this strong resonance with the Jewish people. And, um, you know, I, I'm so glad to be able to lean on to you where I don't have to express like, you know, well, he's innocent. Like I don't have to even explain because you understand what happens when hate becomes a state policy. And that's exactly what's happening to the Uyghur people right now. And that this destruction must be stopped together with the Jewish people um, and Uyghur people together, and obviously as well as the, the the international community. And I hope, like you know, I'll continue to lean on to you and you know my people as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rehan. Um, you know, after you speak, I never know what to say. Um, your words are just so touching. And I think I know that we can all feel your pain and we are with you. you. Um, I would like to introduce a short video now. It is a testimony um, from a Uyghur uh, survivor. His name is Mermit Amin. I do think, I do think that it is important to note that what is happening to the Uyghur and other Turkic minorities is not occurring in a vacuum. Um, there are other repressive actions being enacted against civilians. Samuel, you are a pro-democracy advocate that has worked to secure a freely democratic Hong Kong and have you had a target put on your back by the CCP. Um, so you, you seem, you have an intimate understanding of the CCP, their, their policies and the potential reasoning behind their actions. Can you help us kind of contextualize what we've heard thus far? Yeah, um, thank you, Amber. Uh, as, as you said, I, I think that, you know, as we listen to the personal stories and, and I think what Rehan was talking about in terms of the one and uh, we often, I think, think of and see this oppression, uh, even as closely as we identify with it personally, or from our own family history, or from our own uh, Americans or, or Jewish uh, experience, it still feels kind of distant. Um, it feels far away. It feels like it's, it is in a foreign place. And I think Rehan's story, and many like Rehan, um, it's actually much closer to home. Uh, as you explained, um, I actually am an American citizen. I was the first American citizen to be targeted by the Hong Kong and Chinese government using a national security law. The same reasoning that they use um, in many parts of China, including Xinjiang, 
to say that they are um, trying to um, uh, re-educate, quote unquote, uh, terrorists. They're trying to prevent terrorism and succession. Um, I uh, was issued arrest warrants uh, in Hong Kong for my arrest under national security reasons, simply for speaking out against the crackdown and suppression that the Communist Party was uh, doing in Hong Kong. And so this actually comes much closer to home, I think for uh, all of you that are on this webinar, to think about what it means that this regime that is not only imprisoning and turning and, and, and putting family members and, and individuals and millions of them in camps, but the idea of that to speak out against such genocide, oppression, and violations of human rights uh, would be considered criminal even when you are an American citizen on American soil lobbying your own particular government. And I think that this is an important um, way of, of connecting, I think, what the stories that are, are the atrocities you hear uh, from individuals like Rehan. Uh, and, and, and for me, this is also a, a very personal uh, journey because I think um, many of us come to this not just because we're from Xinjiang or because we're Uyghurs or because we're Hong Kong or from there. Uh, my father, 30 some years ago, was supportive of the Tiananmen Square uh, student protests uh, in 89. And when the massacre happened, the world turned their attention to what was happening. And everybody remembers the pictures of the, the man who stood in front of the roll of tanks uh, on the street of Beijing. Um, and people forget that uh, that was just a moment. Uh, there have been now hundreds and thousands of repeating of that scene taking place every single day in Xinjiang and now in Hong Kong and in Tibet. And I think that sometimes we get uh, lost in this idea of uh, that one moment in history and forget that people who are close to us, and many of you know, I, I work in the, uh, with Mazo and the Jewish response to hunger. I'm not that far removed uh, from the communities and the Jewish communities here in America, that this is happening to people that we know and care about and that your advocacy is absolutely an obligation simply because um, the regime and those who are perpetuating and, and, uh, and, and doing these violations of, of, of human rights want to outlaw your advocacy action in the US. I can't think of a better way to validate how effective the advocacy that you're doing, that you're going to be doing on behalf of this campaign than to have the target of your advocacy uh, try to outlaw and imprison you for doing that exact thing. Thank you, Samuel. Um... I think you are entirely correct. I mean, you thank you for really kind of helping us understand the long arm reach that the CCP is attempting to have in their repressive actions. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Mohammed Mun Qasim. I'm a Khutan Mulaitan of Nice to Tulan. I'm Shuadi Ashwan. Meninke. Ayalim ve şüphelam var. Benim ki, 2015 yılı 4. ayda ayalımdan kusurduğun mecburi 4 aylık olan babamla ağalı komutatını kırıp çürüp etti. Hem de öldürüp çürüp etti. Çürüp etken de gidip öldü. 2019.800 koyu cerimahını aldı. Babamla çürüp etmiş bilen bir gel. Yani cerimahını aldı. Cerimahını aldı. Ondan ki ben işkimin o yetinciyle beşinciyde vatandım, özüm, özüm turvat kan, özüm yaşakan şu suyumluk vatanımdan ayrıldı. Ayrıldı şimdiki sebep ben bir Müslüman bağlıqım, hâzge bağlıqım, ondan ki şu yada bir karakancı bağlıqım için beni o yada tutuş öbük tıkıldı. Ben şunu olayım, ben Dubai'ye geçip çıkışıma mecbur oldum. Çıkımın 17. ile 5. ayda. 
Ben aldım 2017 yılı 7 ayda e, ayalımın ki e, tuğut çekiliş operasyası kıldırıp meyip kılınganlığına aldım. O zaman ben vicat olan ayalımla para almış vatkanıydım. 2017 yılı 7 ayda. 2017 yılı e, şu 7 ay etrafı da mağa, çoğun akam Mehmet Abdullah Kasım e, el e, 49 yaş şu akım akım e, mama pul sebebi geldik sebebi Dubai'ye pul urup geldik sebebi çıkımın o yedinci ile on birinci ayda çoğu akımla lagrağa girip gidip çıkımın on sekizinci ile çoğu akımla ülep gitgeli hevini başkalarına aldım e, ben hazır e, bir cinayet yaşadım ben Amerika'nın ki. Ben hazır ki her gece ayalım ballarım bilen bir yüz durağını yakımız tılfında bir vasıta al haklış bakmadım. I think um, you know it, it's so difficult to hear these stories um, but we we have to become witnesses to these these voices and we have to help amplify them and lift them up um as i stated at the outset of today's panel the united states has recently returned with a determination of genocide in the case of the uyghur but merely stating a determination is not enough there must be tangible policy enacted at the federal level. Luisa, what is Congress doing to address this issue? I'm happy to talk about that. Do you mind if I give some visuals here? Great. So um, I am going to make sure you can see my, my screen. Okay, great. So one of the things that's so been so such a source of hope, as Rehan herself said, is that both um, in Hanukkah this past year and for Passover, there's just been tremendous uh, mobilization of Jewish voices for human rights and solidarity, and that's going to really make a big difference in our congressional advocacy. So I want to thank JCPA for um, convening this just this week um, during Passover. Big effort that. Um, Serena Oberstein may be able to talk about tremendous coming together of atrocity prevention groups, all of us. Um, and there is a huge range of actions that people can take. I know this is a big question in the Q&A, but I'm just gonna concentrate um, at this point on um, one question, which is, yeah, who are the Uyghurs, right? If you're gonna speak up. And I just wanna point out um, on this map, you can see that um, the Uyghur region Xinjiang, Xinjiang uh, Uyghur Autonomous Region is the official title. It's not even considered a province of China. It's an autonomous region. Why? Because it's its own land. Um, Chinese people never lived there. Um, it's the Uyghurs are a Turkic people. So you can see what are the neighboring places, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, um, Uzbekistan's not on the map. Actually, Uzbek and Uyghur are very close. Um, maybe some people say it's 90%. So the Uyghur language is not even related to the Chinese language family. It's related to Turkic languages. And Uyghurs have um, actually lived in different places than shown on this map, um, current Mongolia for you know, a, a thousand or 1500 years ago. But uh, anyway, Uyghurs have followed Islam for a thousand years. That also tells you they're not in China. China came and uh, basically incorporated their land. So that's why you, See Uyghurs, Kazakhs, and others, so, you know, living in China. Why? Well, they lived where they lived, and, and the Chinese government took over their land. Um, so here's some scenery um, from this beautiful homeland, um, and here are the images that you all know about the current repression. Um, it does reach the U.S. As Sam is Samuel is saying, he's a perfect example. The repression repression across borders reaches to him in America as an American citizen for speaking up against CCP. Um, atrocity. So here's the bill. Um, this was already introduced last year um, based on hearings, um, the way it should be. Um, it's very bipartisan. Um, 
you can see here in the picture, Chris Smith from New Jersey, Jim McGovern from Massachusetts, here's Marco Rubio from Florida, um, bipartisan, bicameral support for Uyghurs is already in place. So that's where membership of JC JCPA and others comes in. We just need to get more co-sponsors on the bills. So this bill was introduced last year already, S3471. Um, in the House under a different number, it passed easily. 413 to six, but it got stuck in the Senate. So it never passed. So now it's been reintroduced um, in both the House and Senate so that it can, can become law. This bill will um, really tighten up existing US law not to allow forced labor imports into the US because our cotton supply chain in particular is tied up with um, China's cotton. 80% um, of China's cotton is grown in the Xinjiang region um, and forced labor is one of the major modes of conducting the genocide against the Uyghur people. Um, this should be very, very familiar to all peoples who have a history of genocide that uh, state-imposed forced labor is always a huge part of breaking uh, a people and um, uh, eliminating the leadership, uh, including the intellectuals um, like uh, Rehan's uh, brother. And so this bill um, needs co-sponsors. So I'm gonna show you right now, um, this is Senate Bill 65, Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act. It has 38, actually has 39 co-sponsors because um, uh, Senator Kane in Virginia has also co-signed. It's just not on the website as of this morning yet. Um, but we'd like to get it up to 60. So Marco Rubio is the Republican sponsor and Jeff Merkley here, I don't know if you can see it at the bottom, is the um, Democratic co-sponsor. And um, we really need co-sponsors like Kristen Gillibrand of New York, Chuck Schumer of New York, um, Bernie Sanders of California, I mean, of, of Vermont, I'm sorry, of Vermont. Um, we also uh, really, there, there are 60 senators who haven't yet co-sponsored it. And having more co-sponsors will really help with pushing it through. The Senate Foreign Relations Committee is planning to mark it up. So at least it's moving forward. It'll be in committee the middle of next month coming up very quickly. The more co-sponsors we can have on this bill before it gets marked up, the likelier it is that it will move through the agenda. You know, the Senate never votes on anything, right? So we need it going forward. The counterpart bill in the House, um, same name, um, HR 1155, Nancy Pelosi has um, firmly endorsed this. And you saw how she got this through the House, same bill through the House last September. It's now reintroduced doesn't have that many co-sponsors. So if anyone's really energized and wants to try to see if you're a member of Congress would be willing to co-sponsor, that'd be great, but it will sail through. So we're not particularly concerned about um, mobilizing and campaigning for the bill in the house. It's really more the Senate. There is another bill in the house that's really important to Uyghurs. It's called, the short title is not on here because it hasn't been registered yet. It's called the Uyghur Human Rights Protection Act and it's about US asylum policy. Um, that only also has um, six co-sponsors. So we have, um, you know, we'll soon have an action item for getting more co-sponsors for this bill um, to have the State Department make it much easier for Uyghurs stranded in other countries who cannot go home. If they do, the same thing will happen to them that would happen to Rehan's brother. Um, so we need um, this bill to go through. I wanna mention the Olympics. You know, it's Beijing Winter Olympics 2022. And we really don't wanna have our our athletes, right, who are going for gold, they represent the best and striving for excellence in sport. And they're about to be forced to compete for gold medals in another genocide Olympics. So that's something we can ask questions about, uh, answer questions about if people have any. So that's what I wanted to share for now and happy to answer questions. Thank you so much, Louisa. Um, I think we're going to turn to Serena and we will get to question and answer. I know it's the question and answer chat is kind of blowing up and we will certainly get to as many as we can. Um, but first, Serena, you and your colleagues at Jewish World Watch have been not only very active on the legislative front, but on the business engagement front as well. Um, why should businesses be concerned about what is happening to the Uyghur and how have you engaged them on this issue? Thanks so much, Amber, and thanks uh, JCPA, TME, for inviting us and putting this together. Um, you know, I, I, I can repeat what, what you've heard from Rehan and Samuel and Louisa um, about what's happening, right? Like the horror stories that we're hearing 
about the Uyghur people taken in the night, being separated from their families, having their heads shaved, interned, and forced into slave labor, systematically disappeared are all too familiar to the Jewish community. Um, Jewish World Watch got engaged on this issue about two years ago, um, working with organizations like UHRP and also Uyghurs here in Los Angeles to amplify the voices and, of, of Uyghurs and push for necessary policy. And um, just last year, it became very evident to myself and a number of other Jewish organizations that we were all working on this issue because it was so personal. And so rather than um, doing things disparately, we came together as a coalition. Uh, JCPA, thank goodness, is, is a part of that coalition um, to ac across, across countries um, and across organizational missions to, to maximize our collective voice. Um, and we formed a subcommittee of the Coalition to End Uyghur Forced Labor, um, focusing on advocacy, business engagement, and the Beijing Olympics, things that have all been mentioned. Um, because we know what happens when the world sits silent. Right now, we know that uh, at, least, at least 90 multinational corporations, including Volkswagen, Hugo Boss, BMW, CNA, Adidas, and IBM, are all using Uyghur slave labor, um, which as you may know, all of the companies I just listed have direct ties to the Holocaust. Um, over the course of this past week, Jewish World Watch along with 18 other Jewish and Uyghur human rights organizations came together for a Uyghur week of action, starting with uh, a global Seder on Tuesday, which is you, if you missed it, uh, we have the link and I'd be happy to share it. It was um, a really powerful, incredible hour. Um, and, and then on Wednesday, we, we reached out to our elected officials to lowercase l lobby on the bills that Louisa just mentioned. Um, so we do have scripts to call your senator and we have letters, um, links to letters if you want to send them to your um, congressional members as well. But you know, uh, what we did was we focused yesterday our day of global business engagement on Volkswagen, right? And that's because um, Volkswagen has a factory in Xinjiang, in, in the capital, where it runs, a, a, it has 600 workers producing up to 200 vehicles a year. What we know is that opening a, pl a plant in Xinjiang requires the partnership and approval of, of Chinese authorities. This is not a lack of information or an accident on their part. They are making an active choice and, and we have to hold them accountable. And so yesterday we worked to get a thousand calls into Volkswagen. Um, we had demonstrations here in the US as well as in Sarajevo, in Germany, and the UK. Um, and we can't let companies like Volkswagen do what they did um, and, and make profit on, on the backs of, of slave labor. So um, this is the beginning. This is the, we laid, uh, uh, we created a lot of momentum this week and we're, we're continuing to build. Um, again, it's, it's a number of, of different Jewish uh, and, and Uyghur organizations. And so I'll put the links in the chat and I hope that uh, you'll consider joining us and, and taking action and, and sending a message to Volkswagen and to our elected officials as well. Thank you, Serena. Um, we certainly appreciate all of the work that you have been doing in this arena. Um, so we're now going to try and get to as many questions as we possibly can. The, the majority of the questions that are coming in are really dedicated to what is the root cause? Like why is China specifically targeting the, the Uyghur and the Turkic um, minorities? Um, can, what the official CCP stated justifications for restrictions are, um, I know, Louisa, you have a lot of a, a background on this, same as as Samuel and and Ray Han. You know, I'll open up to whomever would like to to jump in. Um, I'll I'll start, and then maybe others would like to join. The Chinese government, since the beginning of the communist rule in 1949, has always tried to remake Chinese society. First, it was class struggle which some of you may remember was kind of popular on American college campuses. You know, do you remember the little red book, Mao Zedong? Oh, equality, you know, let's do that. Communes, that's a good idea. In China, as uh, carried out by the Chinese Communist Party, it meant labor camps, 
prison sentences, humiliation, torture, and death for many people. Um, my own grandmother actually starved. She's Chinese. She starved in the 1957-58 um, um, famine caused by his utopian totalitarian ideas. Um, then class struggle is not the current issue. The current issue for Uyghurs is separatism. Oh, no, sorry. It's not separatism anymore. It's changed to terrorism and religious extremism. So the Chinese government has cynically used a terrible movement of violent, uh, violent political Islam that has hurt, harmed so many lives and said, ah, oh, China's a victim too. And who's victimizing us? It's the entire Uyghur nation because their thought is infected by a disease. What is the disease? Islam itself. So any kind of normal practice of Islam, um, like if you pray, or if you have a Quran in your house, or you say, Assalamu alaikum, you can be branded as an extremist or a terrorist and then put it, so it's an excuse. It's a pure excuse on the part of the Chinese government, which is afraid of people who are keeping their own identity and are not, um, you know, haven't assimilated over 70 years, so there must be something wrong with them. If I add to that, um, you know, I grew up actually being exposed to both Uyghur culture and Han culture. Um, you know, at the time when Uyghurs were at least allowed to practice our culture and tradition. But, and, and I think like, you know, when I was growing up in the post eighties, like there was this assimilation, like, you know, we assimilate our identity as well as our language in to and become more like a, I guess like a broader Chinese identity. But I think even at that time, like, you know, obviously like, you know, I would love to learn more about my own culture or tradition or language, um, but we, I mean, you, you, you don't have power, you're ethnic minorities and, you know, you're facing a gigantic state. And, you know, the Chinese government started changing the demographic of the region by migrating many Han people to the region. So people who are in power and who actually write these policies and in decision-making and the Han. So what do you do? Like you can't resist. There was some form of resistance but I don't think those were even like, you know, justified what, what comes next. Um, but in 2014, like as Luisa said, the Chinese government started this like strike hard campaign um, and they called it strike um, three evil, one of which is like extremism and separatism and uh, terrorism. And it's just a very broad definition. Like you don't know what you do would be considered as an extremism or like having a Quran or like just a, maybe like you, you're proud to be Uyghur. That is like, oh, you want to establish your own country. Um, but I think um, I could, you know, quote two official uh, speeches and perhaps like that gives you a better narrative. And we're not saying that the Chinese officials use these languages. One is a Chinese official here in the US and he said on TV that we're trying to turn Uyghur people to normal people. So, I mean, I think that statement itself just shows the racism uh, against us and, and apparently they don't think Uyghur culture and Uyghur people are normal people. That's one thing. And the second language they also use is that break their roots, break their connection, break their lineage. So um, so they feel like this culture has to be broken. This people has to be broken. And I, I think they're just like, you know, um, very much deeply rooted, like hate towards our culture uh, and racism. Like all of this uh, ultimately became a policy because under it's a new leadership. I think Xi Jinping changed. It's a whole different China right now. And I think Hong Kong also like, you know, one of the reasons that Hong Kong turned into another normal mainland city, it took place during President Xi Jinping's administration. So I feel like just sum up, um, the idea is to um, create a Chinese-ness out of the Uyghur people, subservient to Xi Jinping. Yes. Yeah, I just, um, uh, for those of us listening, I, I think, again, this resonates so deeply with the Jewish community, right? As we're, as we're ending the holiday of Passover, not soon enough. Um, um, you know, we know the story of the Pharaoh trying to assimilate the Jews, right? Trying to kill all of the, the Jewish boys and marry off the Jewish daughters. And 
throughout European history, we also had that story, right, it, to assimilate, but we were never ever allowed to be the ethnicity or the culture in the place that we lived. We were always Jewish first. Um, and it was always, you know, whether we were Jewish Russian or Jewish Polish or Jewish German. And so, you know, in, in so many ways, this, this story, right, and this is one of the reasons we used Passover, but this story is our, is our story. There's so, we, we, have, to, we have to do something because um, it, it is so connected to the things that we've seen before. Amber, could I add one more thing? Because like this policy for me, just as a woman, like it just deeply hurts me. Um, so we have like men of particular age group, like my brother, who's like young, but as well as a person of influence are detained. And what about them women? And, you know, the, the Chinese government rolled out a policy called becoming family. And they placed this like a million hand civilians into the homes of Uyghur women whose husbands are detained and monitor them. I mean, this is nothing becoming, it's unbecoming. You can't, I mean, it, what about your privacy? It and inevitably led to like sexual abuse. And now we're hearing reports of mass rape coming out of these prison camps. And just like, you know, I mean, um, the idea that somebody would be in my own apartment and just like monitor me and like, you know, and, and that civilian gets to decide whether I too should be sent to prison camp. Like that for me, it just was so hurtful. Like I felt like these women, they don't have agency. They have no power to resist. And this is happening. I, this just like forced labor or like, you know, this detention is just like a few dimensions of this crisis. It's such a, like, um, I feel like every facet of the Uyghur society and Uyghur people are just like a, being destroyed at this moment. And the lastly, the saddest thing is that we're talking about the world's most technologically sophisticated country who can use and deploy disinformation and propaganda every day. Like the Chinese government's own Twitter account, like when their citizens don't have Twitter, it's filled with Twitter propaganda about Xinjiang. Look at these happy Muslim, look at these happy Uyghur people. And I think that's just like so despicable because not only they're trying to hide their crime, but they're trying to portray a different narrative and insulting our intelligence as an international community. And that's very similar to kind of what the Nazis did in Friedenstadt. You know, it was kind of that model camp. Look how happy the Jews are. Look how well we're treating them. You know, this is what we're giving them. They should be so thankful. Um, so we do, I do have some additional questions that I want to make sure we try and get to. Um, here. So why didn't the bill pass the Senate last year after passing overwhelmingly in the House? What was the opposition? I'm sure Samuel will back me up on here. He's been in the Hill for many years. Uh, the agenda was crowded. The Senate passes very few bills to get, begin with, and then there was um, impeachment keeping them busy. So for the most part, um, and there was a mad scramble at the end, um, Rubio with Merkley support, but of course the Republicans were in charge, did actually try to get it into the omnibus bill at the end of the year, it just didn't get in. Um, now, there has been lobbying, and that's been reported by the New York Times, that Nike, Coca-Cola, and Apple were all lobbying. They all denied it to the media, but said we, they were just offering, quote-unquote, um, constructive discussion about the shape of the bill. Um, but uh, And the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, as well as the American Apparel and Footwear Association, plus three other apparel industry associations, uh, came out with statements right after Nancy Pelosi and the House passed the same bill in September saying uh, they share the goals of the bill, but they think it's the wrong vehicle because it will create a guilty until proven innocent standard for American businesses that want to import cotton products. And actually they're right because, you know, and even since then the U.S. government has made a, a, a genocide determination and is constantly talking about the high, high risk of forced labor because actually we know that the government's plan is for every adult of working age to be in a state assigned place of labor. This is not some people getting caught up. This is absolutely everyone will be under complete government control. 
And so it's not voluntary labor. So even if they're not working in a factory, it's involuntary. So how could there be um, cotton goods coming from Xinjiang, the Xinjiang region, that you can be sure is not made in an atmosphere of forced labor? So um, you know, companies can object all they want, but Congress is right to impose its will. So we do think that this will pass this year, especially with the genocide designation. There was a question that should we refrain from buying only cotton products from China or any <clears throat> Chinese made products? Um, if only certain products use forced labor, where can we learn which ones? There is a wonderful report called Uyghurs for Sale that identified uh, more than 80 brands that are implicated in this. Uh, cotton is like one um, industry, uh, tomato is another industry, but also like, um, you know, just like what really worries me and I think it's really sickening is the um, technology that was deployed in not only creating a surveillance state, but also like in creating a separation of family. Like recently, um, my, I don't know if it's because of my advocacy, but uh, my brother was seen in three minute video. I can discuss beyond that, not to put my family at risk, but um, he looked like bones and skull in, in that video. And so, and I really wish that they, they were able to like took a picture and show it to, to the world, like what, ha has they done to him? Because that is a hard evidence, except they couldn't. And I think like, you know, I hope like that gives you an explanation how much intrusive uh, surveillance state the Chinese government has created. So um, be mindful of those companies, like, you know, obviously Huawei is a big driver in this, but there are also many other American companies or actually American technology that were incorporated or use in these, um, you know, surveillance, um, all sorts of surveillance, like we're not just talking about like what they have created. So um, those are the things that we really need to be mindful because we don't want to be like, you know, complicit in in this horrific crimes that the Chinese government committing. I can just add, oh, sorry. Here, go ahead, Sam. I think this question is always, uh, it, it, I, and sometimes in American culture, particularly, we have this tendency to jump to like, let's boycott and not buy and, and sort of define our particular actions according to consumption. I just want to flag that it is true. I think that we have to be conscious. I think we should ask questions, but I think that we have to go beyond the minimum of just deciding if this company is actively, knowingly using you know, cotton that are from forced labor. I think sometimes we, we get caught in this very minimal basic level of like, oh, if they can prove that they don't use it, then it's okay. The idea here is that they have a responsibility to change the way that the system from this very uh, fundamental supply chain from the very beginning, um, that they should not be let off the hook simply because they can prove that they're not or that on the website they say that, you know, we don't use, um, uh, you know, forced labor. Uh, and I think that it is important. That's why I think that, you know, the, the work that uh, Jewish World Watch have done on Volkswagen, uh, the, the, the cotton uh, boycott that has been uh, uh, talked about is so important because it is actually uh, a entry point. It's a starting point. We're not going to be able to individually boycott our way to bring China to its, you know, to, to reverse its actions. What we can do is to use the boycott and use these moments to demand that US companies and other Western company has to do more than just to uh, wash your hands and say that, look, we didn't do it, so it's okay. I'll, um, Jewish World Watch is working on uh, a report right now. Um, looking in specifically at the companies, the, the, the ones with ties to the Holocaust. So looking at their culpability then, looking at their culpability now, and then um, working with um, a, a business strategy firm to think about strategic engagement. But um, one of the companies I, I mentioned, Adidas, has actually said that, you know, they are gonna 
pull out of, of China. They're not going to be using Uyghur forced labor. So there are opportunities to potentially at least lift those kinds of companies up, right? When we're coming out and saying, look at what Volkswagen is doing wrong, reaching out to companies like Adidas and saying, we heard you're going to do this. This is great. We understand that there's a process. We want to support you through that process and doing that, right? So we're, we're reaching out, we're talking to companies and condemning them, but we're also supporting them as they work to change their ways as well. And yeah, and I think that that's very important. We have to offer up, you know, a, an additional supply chain source. Um, otherwise, businesses are not going to be really um, you know, interested in in going through that process. I do think it's important to to mention though that we are not calling for a boycott of these products. Um, you know, what we are asking is for businesses to have ethical procurement, right? Um, so I, I do have some questions that are coming in that are very much, you know, feeling like we haven't really addressed the root causes. Um, so, you know, is it that the CCP just really has this sort of hatred, this ingrained hatred for the Uyghur? Is there, you know, a motive beyond that because there are natural resources in the Xinjiang province that, you know, the, the CCP wants to be able to utilize. Um, if, if someone would be interested or able to kind of really provide maybe that frame of mind of, of, of why. Um, Samuel, you look like maybe you had an answer in Rehan as well. I, I, I want to be very careful. I don't want to say that we I have an answer. It is a, a complicated right. but I think that uh, yeah. folks have already brought up a couple. I, I do think that there's obviously and, and fundamentally an element of religious, ethnic um, uh, persecutions that I think is, is genocide. That is the uh, one part of it. So the difference, the idea that this is uh, there is a, 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 a ability to oppress and, and blame a particular minority. I think it's, it's definitely one. I, I do want to go back. I think the, the, the reason why I know that that is not the, you know, like uh, Louisa and, and Rihanna said, that um, the, the, the terrorism, the succession is not a legitimate justification. It's because in Hong Kong, we are being named, blamed for the same exact thing. We are as Western before the last two years, as Western, as international, as, you know, quote unquote free uh, of a society and city as you can find. Our descent to the CCP is also branded as terrorism, succession, and colluding with foreign powers and that we're somehow threatening the national security. So I do think that this goes back to how that the, uh, the, the difference in uh, ethnic culture, language in the region, the difference in the uh, culture, economic, uh, human rights experience of Hong Kong, uh, that threatened fundamentally uh, the regime ability to completely control its population, which is the only way that this particular regime has done. And I think that, um, you know, people forget that, you know, in China, in mainland, uh, you can, there's no Twitter, there's no, I mean, there is a ongoing attempt to maintain this total control because that is a fundamental uh, necessity for Xi Jinping and the CCP to actually stay in power. So I think that that is the other element that I think, um, and, and I think it manifests itself in all kinds of, um, in Tibet and the idea of sovereignty uh, you know, why Chinese government is always so gung-ho about talking about sovereignty is because sovereignty is at the heart of the ability for the CCP to maintain power. And that's the only way that they can do it. And so it may it be Hong Kong, may it be Xinjiang, may it be Tibet, may it be Taiwan. It is the same exact route that goes back into uh, holding on to, to, to political um, control. Rehan, go ahead. You're you're muted. I'm muted. Yeah, the region is like historically known for you know having abundant 
mineral resources and like rich oil and gas and this has been the case historically and the Chinese government has could like you know actually built pipeline to transfer like all these resources to actually develop other regions in Shanghai or many other cities and you know actually like um you know there was a time I think uh, one one governor said he was accused like not being able to develop Xinjiang and he said well if you could leave like 10% of the the resources that you're taking I'm able to to make this like the most prominent and prosperous city of all and I think he was persecuted for saying that so that's the one thing and uh, those are also like you know what some of the factors but uh, another one is like this Belt and Road project, which is the most ambitious uh, infrastructure project the Chinese government was designed to connect the east to the west, right? Like they, they wanted to connect the entire world. And Xinjiang, um, the region for its location is that just like, you know, everything, like, you know, that's where like everything meets. And I think this um, also like this deeply rooted insecurity in its, um, for being able to still hold the power. And I think because of the, the, this region, um, I mean, a lot of things has changed since Xi Jinping came to power. You know, as I said, there was a time like, you know, yeah, there were discrimination and, but still like, you know, Uyghurs were given opportunities like my brother. I mean, it was never easy. Even for us to get a passport was never easy. I was only be able to get a passport because I studied in Wuhan and I was able to move my residency to Wuhan. Um, and, and and at some point, like my brother got his because there was a desire to, maybe these policies are not fair. Let's maybe loosen up a little bit. There was at least this like self-examination and self-corrections that existed and all of that gone now under Xi Jinping and, and his, um, this like, you know, one China dream that he wanted to create, like, you know, and I think this rejuvenation of the uh, China after years of century of humiliation I think and we became the prime victims and, and then later Hong Kong and and who knows who's next. Thank you. I think we have um, one more question that we're going to pose here. So the, the CCP is a dangerous power far beyond its horrific treatment of the Uyghurs. They work to undermine democracy around the world and threaten Chinese immigrants to try to pressure them to work as spies, among other issues. Um, what policies do you think a Biden administration can take against such a powerful regime and a country that our economy is so intertwined with? Yeah, so I mean, I, I can start and, and others can fill in. I, I think that, again, I think there's obviously, um, you know, just recently we added uh, a number of uh, individual targeted sanctions. Uh, those obviously have a role to play as far as economic sanctions, because I think it does raise the visibility and, and I think control some of it. But I'll be very honest, I think that all of us uh, who are in this world of advocacy and policy understand that um, sanction economic alone is not going to be enough. Uh, it, it is uh, the, the cotton issues had exposed, I think, the, the how massive our, and globalized the economy is. And, and it's not like we can just shut down and, and turn off the faucet um, uh, without causing, I think, a, a lot of uh, unintended consequences. So I think what we are seeing is that I think uh, in addition to directly um, addressing like uh, what we already talked about in terms of forced labor, holding the U.S. companies accountable, taking in those who are fleeing persecutions uh, from the CV from the region, who are stuck in third countries. The other parts I think we have to be very proactive about is to make sure that China is not able to export globally their authoritarian way of ruling and governance on international levels. So a lot of what you're seeing right now is, for example, um, the use and regulation of internet access. Uh, China and Russia are two of the countries that has the most you know, robust uh, policy in terms of regulating internet information and access, and they're exporting it to other countries. 
They are also the ones who utilizes uh, surveillance uh, technologies uh, in a way that is specifically targeting ethnic minority like uh, the Uyghurs. And, and we have to, as particularly US American companies and American government, American public, be able to propose and have a alternative on how we want to protect digital freedom, how we want to deal with uh, other ways of democratic structure, you know, way of governing ourselves together as an alternative. Because if not, the influence that you see, and as someone has asked about, you know, UN and all these other things, is that uh, what the Chinese government have been able to do and the regime has been able to do is to buy the influence into you, you know, international bodies to be able to say that, well, I will pay for your investment and development in your country, but you have to vote for us on the UN Council. And, and, and I think to counter that, we have to have a much more distinctive democratic way of, that we advocate for, from internet governance to public health, to the way in which that we deal with you know, the COVID crisis uh, and pandemic. And, and I think that all of those things are, are incredibly important because again, um, economic sanctions and, and, and pressure on supply chain in itself isn't going to be enough. Thank you, Samuel. Um, we are over our time a little bit. Um, I want to thank all of you for being here today and um, having this conversation. And I want to thank JCPA for inviting us here today. Um, we will provide a lot of the, the links and the resources that we sent out in the chat. We will, we will follow up with that in an email and you will receive some action alerts from us as well on things that you can do um, to work with your representative to get these le this legislation passed and how we can ultimately bring an end to what is happening to the Uyghur. So thank you for being here today and um, hopefully you will join us for a panel in future.